Hello. Um, it's great to be here back on this stage. It's a great avenue. Um, so those who know me actually don't know a story. I came to Go years ago, um, not for the language, um, but to read Go's runtime. It was, you know, beautiful, small, remarkably readable, and at that, I was, at that time I was curious how, you know, Go Runtime managed to do scheduling that it almost feels like as a user I never end up like, you know, having to care about it unless I'm um, creating Go routines in a tight loop or something. Um, I had, you know, little idea that like after so many years that I will come here, get on stage and will explain the same story to an audience this size, uh, but you know, runtime scheduler has gone through a few significant rethinks and improvements, uh, but it's quite much the same since 1.1. And um, I will try my best to explain uh, what it primarily does and the pri principles um, it's built on. So before specifically explaining the details of the runtime scheduler, I will just begin with the basics. What is um, a scheduler? And then I will give you a glimpse of what the runtime scheduler does um, and its core responsibilities. Um, I will introduce the two interesting concepts, uh, work stealing and spinning, to further explain the specific improvements that I mentioned the um, scheduler went through. So let's begin with the basic question. What is a scheduler? In its most basic sense, um, scheduling is distributing some work over the available resources. You probably heard about um, some of the other schedulers before, such as operating systems process scheduler um, that you know manages um, the processes work over um, available CPUs or network schedulers or container schedulers such as Kubernetes uh, that schedulers containers over a fleet of machines. Um, Go has a runtime scheduler, and the runtime scheduler's primary duty is um, to distribute Go routines over um, the operating system threads that runs on all available CPUs. Um, in the most basic terms, it prioritizes and runs the runnable Go routines, um, park them if needed, for example, if they are blocked or something, and repeat the cycle again and again. Um, before diving more into the details of the scheduler, um, let me clarify the main actors here. Um, we will talk about processors, threads, and Go routines all through this talk. Um, processors are the CPU cores, the actual processing power we have on board. Um, threads are the native OS threads. In Go, you know, we don't deal with the OS threads, but it's happening internally at the runtime. Everything is just run on a native operating system thread in the end, right? Um, and Go routines are the lightweight threads we use daily, and there again, managed by the runtime. So the life of a Go routine is simply between these fundamental states. Um, a Go routine is either currently running or ready to run, runnable, um, but waiting for its turn, um, or it's not runnable. Um, for example, it's blocked uh, because, and waiting for a system call. Um, at any time, um, scheduler's job is to run the runnable Go routines um, with the currently available capacity. So Go has an NMN scheduler. Um, what it does is it distributes some M number of Go routines over an OS threads. Um, since OS threads are quite expensive to create, start, stop, um, we utilize a small number of OS threads uh, to, large, uh, to run a large number of Go routines. Um, and of course, we still need to figure out you know, which Go routines um, should run at any time, given we have such a smaller pool of OS threads. Um, and it's also worth to note that like, Go can scale up to multiple processors. Um, so the, our, our basically, um, the question is, at any time, um, there are multiple cores that run a small pool of, Go to, um, pool of OS threads to run all the existing Go routines. So here's an illustration. It's so much better with an illustration, I guess. Uh, we have a Go program here running on a two-core system. Um, the runtime created some OS threads, um, T1 to T5. You can see T1, T2, T3. T1 and T3 is currently running. And uh, there are a bunch of Go routines. Um, G1 and G5 are currently running. Uh, we, we have like a runnable queue. And there are also non-runnable Go routines, uh, which might eventually become runnable again um, and wait for the scheduler um, to be run. Um, 
So our job um, when scheduling is um, to utilize the current runnable threads uh, with the go, go, uh, runnable Go routines as much as possible. Um, in this scenario, it's also worth to note that there are only two cores, uh, P1 and P2, but it can be any number of available processors. So there are two big challenges in this model. Um, the distribution of the global runnable queue over OS threads requires a global log, uh, which is highly costly. And um, if the kernel ends up um, keeping an OS thread running in the lifetime of a Go routine in context which is so often, it will be as you know, costly as having no lightweight threads at all. Um, and as a reminder, you know, Go is a great language to write servers, so Go programs are often I.O. bonded, and Go routines are often running very shortly and got I.O. blocked. Um, in order to deal with the first challenge of um, eliminating the global lock, um, Go runtime schedulers switch to a model where we depend less on the global queue um, and to minimize the excessive context switch. We, uh, runtime does a little bit of spinning rather than letting these threads go and prompt. Um, I will try to explain all these concepts and how they improve the situation. So to, to address the first problem of having to rely on a global lock, uh, this Go scheduler introduced works still in, in 1.1. In um, parallel computing, there are two scheduling strategies. Work sharing, uh, the previous model used by the uh, scheduler, depends on a mechanism to migrate some of the work uh, to the other processors as new work is being created. And you know, if there are other processors that are underutilized, the central mechanism is just migrate and then you will create it work to the other processors. Um, whereas in work still in, an underutilized processor is actively looking for other processors to steal some work from them. So this model has better performance characteristics and less contention overhead. Um, in the still-in model, each processor has a local queue now, and in this case, T3 doesn't have anything to, anything to run, and it's starving for work. And rather than going to the runnable um, queue, the global queue, it will try to steal from the first processor's local queue for us first. Um, and if there's nothing available there, um, it will look for the global queue. And even if there's nothing there in the global queue, um, it means that everything must be I.O. blocked or something, so the scheduler will just pull the network and wait for something to be um, runnable. So most of the schedule and strategy is just literally can be read at uh, runtime packages schedule function. And as I, you know, it's kind of like what the illustration uh, was like. Um, what it does is check in the global runnable queue one sixteen of a time, um, not to give advantage, a lot of advantage to the local queues. If um, there are no you know, runnable Go routines there, it checks the local queue of the current uh, processor. And um, if there are still no runnable Go routines, it will try to steal from other processors' queues. And still not found, it will then again check the global run runnable queue. And if still there's nothing found, it means that um, everything must be blocked. And Scheduler will pull the network, um, wait for at least one Go routine to be runnable. So returning back to those two strategies I listed initially, um, we still need to address the overwhelming amount of context switches. Um, constant preemption is both expensive and is a problem for high you know, throughput programs if performance is critical. Um, OS threads shouldn't frequently you know, hand off um, runnable Go routines between each other. Also, on the other hand, in the presence of I.O., um, OS threads are constantly blocked and unblocked. Um, this is costly and it's a lot of overhead. Um, this is why threads created by the Go runtime does a little bit spinning, um, does a little bit of work, so they are not immediately preempt. Um, we leverage the idea of you know, it's worth to burn a little bit CPU cycles than to let the OS thread, you know, preempt and wait for another one to be runnable again. So we consider a thread spinning in three cases. Um, in all these cases, spinning thread will get out of the spinning state as soon as um, it finds work. So what are these three states? Um, 
The first state is if a thread is running, um, and if, thread is, if a thread is not uh, running any Go routines and already has a processor assigned to it, um, it will spin to search new um, runnable Go routines. It will you know, do a little bit like search to burn that CPU. It's useful, uh, but it will also avoid it to be preempt. Um, the second case is a thread is spinning if um, it doesn't have any processor assignment and looking for available um, for looking for an underutilized processor um, for its official assignment. And the last case is um, when we are ready in a Go routine, um, if there's an idle processor out there, we will unpark a thread. And you know, just as soon as the Go routine is available, we want to make sure that the newly unparked thread to run it so in this case, um, we will unpark T1, and as soon as G2 is available, it will be executed. We call this intermediate state also um, spinning. So to conclude, Go scheduler tries to better utilize um, the processing power by scheduling things on the underutilized processors, and does this by trying to avoid global locks as much as possible. It also um, spins the thread to help avoid high occurrence of preemption in trying to do the best uh, to keep the you know, currently running OS thread running as much as possible. And um, there's one more thing. And you know, obviously, there is no way that we can understand how Go runtime works by simply reading the code. Um, the best way to understand the scheduling events is to use the execution uh, tracer. So you can visualize and understand you know, what else you can do to better utilize or see if you can like, have any you know, significant design mistakes. Um, here's an example of a case where you can improve the performance. By, this, is, um, this is the output of the execution tracer. Each row is um, a core. And you can see um, um, some Go routines have been utilized. Um, and you can see some gaps. Those gaps are where the core is not utilized. Um, and by looking at this visualization, maybe you, know, you can further understand if it's a design mistake or if it's just a mutex um, that you know, en ends up you having underutilization. And there's another case here that you can see that um, the cores are pretty utilized in the beginning, but everything depends on a single core after that. You know, um, could be a mutex or could be a design mistake. So um, execution tracer just visualizes it and makes it very easy to see what is going on. So the scheduler is a component we all depend on, um, you know, empowered and sometimes constrained by, but I think learning more about the runtime internals gives you uh, more confidence um, about the scheduler and what it does out of the box. And thank you so much.